four o'clock. Okay. So oh, no, at, at uh, ten. JC, ten o'clock. Yeah. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? It's a great day to be here. All right, we're going to um, come to order and like council to consider uh, adding an item to the agenda. In front of you is an item labeled consider making appointments, reappointments to Concord United Committee. Um, we're going to add that as item number 13. Is there a motion to do that? Second. Motion second. All in favor, please raise your hand. So, Andy, you, you, you don't know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nah, it's pretty good. All right, under uh, presentations, we have one, one this evening, presentation proclamation recognizing May 21st through 27th, 2020, I suppose three, as National Public Works Week. If, uh, um, Philip, if you can come forward and also with your staff. Let me ask you this question. Who's here today? Who's here? Hello? We've got uh, just one of our um, public works individuals. Um, so we've got uh, Brian Taylor here with transportation. Uh, we've got Leslie Hanna with wastewater. We've got Darius Cook with stormwater. Public Works Week. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facility, and services that are of vital importance to the sustainability and resilience of the communities, and to the public health, high quality of life, as well as the people of the City of Concord. And whereas, the, whereas this infrastructure facilitates and facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees of all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our, nationals, our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential to our citizens. And where else, where else it is the public interest for all citizens and civic leaders in the city of Concord to gain knowledge of and to maintain an ongoing interest in understanding the importance of public works and public work programs in their respective communities. And where, whereas this year, 2023, marks the 63rd annual National Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association and the Canadian Public Works Association. Now, therefore, I, William C. Dush, Mayor of the City of Concord, along with the Council, hereby proclaim this week, May 20, or the week from May 21st to 27th, 2023, as National Public Works Week in the City of Concord. So let's have a round of applause for our staff. And, well, well, before you take it away, <laughs> as I was chatting, chatting to these individuals before, I asked the question of what do you like the most and what is the most challenging? So I'm just going let, to let you tell us what you, what you like the most about the job and what you find the most challenging. And then we'll go to Warren. Can I answer that with Warren? Yes. Yes, you can. What was uh, accommodating requests? Yes, it's 
good. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll go with that good. Good. I like that. Yes, sir. Andrew Google Fiber, yes. Yeah, you got a lot of say over that, don't <laughs> okay. Everybody listen to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to I just want to thank you guys. We're all going to pull in together for a shot. All right, um, we're moving on to our public hearings now. We will be doing downtown streetscape update on Thursday, along with three other presentations. Uh, so item one, public hearings, conduct a public hearing pursuant to NC, NC General Statute 158.7.1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, call on Sam to come up and provide this item to council this evening. considering the location of their operation at the grounds at Concord. Um, the site is located near the existing building at Newtown Way in George Lyles. Um, there's not an address to this parcel, but the parcel number for this site is 551907-79329. The site is approximately a 40-acre portion of this parcel located at the northern end of Newtown Way Southwest. Um, the ODFL Concord project includes the construction of a new interstate motor freight terminal ODFL is a less than truckload freight carrier specializing in one and two day delivery markets. The operation can generally be described as picking up and delivering general commodities um, between the local community and all over the country. Um, their function of moving goods is an important um, component needed to support local and interstate commerce. They plan to create 100 um, new jobs with average wages exceeding our current county average wage and their projected investment in real property is between 18 and 19 million. The City of Concord grant analysis is based on that estimated 18 million investment in real property. Old Dominion is asking for your consideration of a one-year 85% economic development grant on that real, um, real property investment. The estimated grant amount is $73,440. Net revenue to the city during that grant term is around 13,000. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Any questions from council? Yes, sir. Thank you, Sam. Um, first, I have two questions, um, and, and I know we've been over this, and, and last time we talked about this, I was out of town, so I was listening 
remember through the phone and the microphone. So yeah. can you tell me the number of trucks that'll be coming in and out of there a day? Do you know? I'm hoping that I have. I know it's a minimal number of trucks in traffic, they said. I don't know that I have the specific number with me today. Um, I do not, but we can certainly get that to you. Okay, Thursday. that'd be great. And the, and the other, well, t three questions. Let's follow up on that one. The, the entrance and exit of that will be on George Lyles, or will that be on Concord That's Parkway? That's my understanding, uh, access from <clears throat> Newtown Way onto George Lyles. Okay, so that side street that comes in where Carvana goes in as well, that's going to be the access point? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other thing I have, will those jobs that are created be domiciled in Concord? Because the trucking industry sometimes will have domiciled jobs elsewhere, so I'll just be curious to know if those are... Sure. Um, and I'm going to look at pages. Because my granddad was a roadway truck guy, and he lived in Concord, but he'd run sure. two, one two-day routes. But some people also lived, like in Charleston, and, you know, would go back. I think back. it's our understanding that those 100 jobs would be local, that their home base would be here in this area. They're, yeah, they're not long-distance trucks. They're, I think you said, one to two days. So they're in and out. So they're hoping that they, I mean, of course, just like with any of our employers, they might hire some folks from out of town, but the intention is for, for those jobs to be primarily local. Mm -hmm. That's the intent? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Item number two, conduct a public hearing pursuant to NC General Statute 158.7. Consider granting a three-year, 85% tax base, Center City. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So call on Brad to come up and present this item to council this evening. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council members, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kuczynski, and Ms. Deason. This agenda item is a request for a three-year, 85% Center City Economic Development Grant for the project called Climbing Rose, which is located at 69 and 75 Corbin Avenue Southeast. The proposed project would be approximately 18,192 square foot mixed use development that falls within the Center City Zoning District. Estimated investment is $4.2 million. The proposal would include a first floor or street level uh, commercial spaces, five was proposed. Uh, with one restaurant and probably four retail kind of being the target mix. Second, third floors would consist of 10 residential units total, uh, five on each floor with a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, and this proposal has a unique feature in that the rooftop will have some space, open air space set aside for a social or lounging area for the residents. And council allocated the sewer back in July of 2022. So just sort of a location map, Let's see the proposed development would be included in this square here. It comprises two parcels. Uh, just as a reference point, this mark here is 65 Corbin Avenue Southeast, which is the formerly the Crest Plumbing, Crest Brothers Plumbing and Heating Building. And, there's my mask. and of course you have uh, County Hall over here and the post office and the Sheriff's Department over here. So here's a street level view of the proposed development. Again, there are two parcels here, adjacent to the uh, former Crest Brothers building. First parcel is 69 Corbin Avenue Southeast, which is basically this old uh, sort of garage and uh, storage unit of some type here, container unit. And then 75 Corbin Ave constitutes the house. These two parcels will be combined into one to allocate for uh, space for the actual development. So, so here's some renderings. Can, can you go back, just, just to be clear? Okay. This, this does include the former Crest Brothers site or not? No. Okay, so it's actually this, three, is three. This, this, this house, the yellow house yes. there, and the vacant land. And up to, up to this okay. old garage, yeah. Thank you. Now, the owner, there's one owner for all three properties. Hmm but it does not include this building. This building will remain as is. Okay. It's just these two parcels here. Thank you. Okay, so some renderings for the proposed project. Uh, this is looking at uh, the project from Corbin Avenue Southeast. 
as you can see here, you have some, so some more sort of mix of retail and possibly restaurant space here with some outdoor seating. This building here in the back is uh, the former Crest Brothers building. Here's another angle from Corbin Ave, uh, Crest Brothers building over here. Um, here you have uh, a view of the back of the building from the parking lot. And then, one, let me get that one. And this one you have a sort of a higher angle of the front of the building, also shows a little bit of the rooftop. And it's a little hard to see possibly here, but you will have some mechanical equipment that'll be screened in here but then you'll have use of the open space around here for the residents. Uh, kind of zooming in a little bit in some of that open space sort of concept. You have some planter here with some greenery, some furniture, uh, some additional small tables and chairs. And then finally some open area. I mean, they show cornhole here, but some sort of activity perhaps here for the residents. So here's the actual site plan. The shaded area is where the proposed development would go. Back here's the parking lot. We'd have one um, source of ingress here off of McCatcher and Boulevard, and it would flow here towards the parking lot. Then we have a point of uh, ingress, egress, connecting to Shin Street on this side. And then finally, the, the three-year 85% grant breakdown looks something like this. It's a minimum investment of $4.2 million. The city taxes collected over the three-year period would total $60,480. The grant at 85% totaled over the three-year period uh, would equal $51,408. And the net taxes to the city for the three-year period would be $9,072. That concludes staff's presentation. Be more than happy to answer any questions council might have. That's in Center City, but not the MSD. That's correct. Okay. Correct. If you, um, well, the the uh, the old uh, Crescent Brothers building that actually is the end of the MSD. Yeah. So this falls just outside that. Okay. Question from council. Yes, Jennifer. A question, but I, I guess I would just kind of like to state that this is not just the reason is because it sits in the center city that it is um, that this grant is available for consideration just kind of wanted to make sure we reiterate that that it's not a citywide thing that we can do so. yeah um, and the, I, I was kind of we, we talked about, did we ever talk about at one point, and maybe I shouldn't talk closed session, but I was thinking for some reason in the back of my head it was a one-year grant, but most of our center cities are, are three. Generally, they're three. So that's the, the normal standard for that. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Correct, thank you. Okay, good, that's it. And and ditto what Jennifer said. I, I, I think that's important to emphasize is that that's a special grant we have for, for center city. So. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Item number three, conduct a public hearing to approve the submission of fiscal year 23-24 action plan. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mary is going to come forward and present this to, uh, to council this evening. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinsky, as council is aware, each year community development submits to the Housing and Urban Development Department an annual action plan, and this action plan covers the proposed activities for fiscal year 23-24, and it covers what Concord does propose to do with our CDBG and our home funds, and it also includes the home consortium members' proposal of their use of funds. The City of Concord will be receiving $605,948 in their allocation under CDBG, and the home consortium will be receiving $1,300,000 $15,523 for home allocation, and of that, Concord will be receiving two million, sorry, $223,592.55 for projects with another $85,768 for administration. 
of the home consortium and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions from council? Thank you. Okay, item number four, conduct a public hearing considering adopting ordinance annexing 278.58 acres. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Autumn's gonna come forward from the planning department. She's gonna present items four and five to council this evening. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Wachinski, Ms. Deason. This is an annexation petition for 6400 Breezy Lane. Um, and this, the applicant is Michael Wilson on behalf of uh, the Water and Sewer Authority of Cabarrus County. This is the Rocky River Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, the current zoning is Cabarrus County Low Density Residential. And we will be proposing, um, if the annexation is approved, City of Concord um, office institutional. So this is a nonprofit tax exempt property that doesn't pay fire district taxes. So we would not be responsible for any reimbursement of funds to the volunteer fire department. This is our zoning map. Um, you can see that for the most part, this is surrounded by uh, residential zoning. Um, to the west, you see um, City of Concord residential compact and then to the southwest um, City of Concord planned residential development. To the east it is um, Cabarrus County. Most of that is again residential. There's countryside residential um, as well as agricultural open space. So the 2030 land use plan does designate this as civic institutional where OI, which is going to be the recommended zoning, um, is a compatible uh, zoning for this particular area. Um, so while it will need to go to PNZ um, to have zoning applied, it does not require a land use plan amendment. If this, if this annexation is adopted, it will go before PNZ um, tentatively on June 20th um, for recommendation for the OI zoning. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Any question from council? Okay, thank you very much. Sure. All right, number five, conduct a public hearing, consider adopting an ordinance annexing 22.4 acres. This is an annexation petition for 226 Burr Ridge Road. Um, the applicant is William Niblock uh, with Niblock Homes and this is on behalf of uh, the Brown family. This is approximately 22.4 acres. It's currently zoned RM1 in our ETJ and the proposed zoning is still City of Concord RM1. Um, and uh, this will be the construction of 25 single family detached homes. And for this particular project, um, sewer allocation was approved in September of 2022. This is the zoning map. Again, you can see that it's surrounded mostly by um, residential, have OI to the west, county LDR, and agricultural open space. Existing conditions, again, residential pretty much surrounding this, this entire area. The next steps here will be to consider the annexation request. This will not have to go to PNZ because it already does have zoning in the ETJ and it will just revert to RM1. And I should note that the houses to be built um, on this parcel will follow the RM1 design standard. All right, question from council. Go ahead. Yeah, that's. <laughs> like, how do you access the property? Yeah. Go, go back a couple of slides. I believe they told us that the property towards Burridge would be incorporated in this so neighborhood. The, the parcel right in front of this one is also their property, but it's already in the city, so they'll access it through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Is that the one where they just built that? Okay, that that's the one at the curve. Right? Yes. Got it. Any more questions? Brian? Like RM1 design standard? Yeah. 
So the value they have listed on their application is approximately 16.2 million for all of the houses. Mm -hmm. say, say that again, I couldn't hear what you said. 16.2 million is what was noted on the application for all of the houses. Yeah, and it looks like they're about um, one acre per, per lot, unless they're doing any kind of common area, which I don't think they are. And, and, both, of, and both of those parcels, the front one that's already in the city, and then the annex one, will, will be where all of these are. So it'll be across those two parcels. Which, which parcel, is that the, where they just built that brand new house? No, it's not. I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Good. All right, any more questions? Thank you, Autumn. Okay, number six, conduct a public hearing to consider adopting an ordinance amending Article 7. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kevin's going to come forth and provide this staff report to council. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Korchinski, Ms. Deason, um, just a little refresher. This was part of, if you recall, the tiny home and cottage home standards that we presented to you in March. And we were instructed at that work session to conduct more research on the tiny home part, but to bring this back to you. And that's from the April work session. Um, as, as we had discussed way back in March, we've, we, we've fielded a lot of inquiries for single story multifamily structures on one overall parcel. Currently the spacing for those 20 feet between structures, and we had proposed to amend that to 10 feet as long as they are single story multifamily structures that would con coincide with the tiny home, cottage home requirements that we were putting forth and also make that more similar to uh, interior side setbacks for typical single family developments. And, and this is the language we are proposing basically to say that the minimum spacing for multi-story buildings would be 20 feet for single story buildings containing one or two units, the minimum spacing between those would be 10 feet. And we also are making one corrective change to state that these are applicable to developments of four or more dwelling units. That's the way it's listed throughout the ordinance and the other parts. That's a corrective part. And so this is the statement of reasonableness and consistency. If you, if you uh, uh, approve Thursday night, you would adopt this or, 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 or something similar. And the next steps would be to consider the amendment and approve that statement of consistency and then adopt or not adopt the changes to the CBA. Any questions? Can you go back one, please? Yes, sir. One further? No, thanks. Okay. Okay. One more? Right, and, and, and the four on the next slide, that basically just says that the multifamily standards for everything apply to developments of four or more units as opposed to five or more units because elsewhere in the code it lists four units as being the threshold that multifamily applies to. Other questions from council? Thank you. Thank you. Number seven, conduct a public hearing to consider adopting an ordinance amending Article 8. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Steve will round out the public hearings this evening. So, Steve, if you would. Yes, sir. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Korchinski. Uh, we're going to dis I'm going to discuss principal structures and accessory structures. So, in table 8 point or section 8.4.3, it's, it's very confusing and the, the primary height for an accessory structure right now, which is detached garage, sheds, pool house, accessory dwelling units, is 15 foot. So, and you have within the accessory structure, and then you have principal structure, and it's, it's 15 foot regardless. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so, with, with the, so with the background, you've got the, the ADUs, 
uh, which I do not know that we've seen a two-story yet, but it's a matter of time mm -hmm. before start using the rear yard smarter, especially for parking and ADUs go up. If someone wanted wanted to place an ADU in the, in the rear yard now, the 15 foot is the max height. So, and, and also just for information, the ADU cannot be larger than 50% of the principal structure or no greater of 1,100 square foot. So with the existing language, that's, there lies the problem. So what we're proposing is to change the height to 15 foot where the accessory structure complies with the minimum setback. And then if it's within the principal structure, it can go 15 foot. And I, we've got an illustration that I think is gonna help more than anything. So the principal structure, that's where your house goes. An accessory structure, say if you have a shed and you wanna place it in the rear yard, you have to be within the five foot. But within that, it's 15 foot max. So what we're proposing is, if, you're, if you have a structure within the principal setback, which is the same as the house, then you can go up to two stories. So now you can accommodate ADUs over a garage. Uh, it, could be, it could be a garage with an apartment above. It could be a very tall structure for an RV. And, and the point is why you don't want greater than 15 foot, because if your neighbor's house is here, you don't want a two-story structure over, over top of it. We get, you can get rifts with neighbors with that. So if you set it back within the principal structure, now you can go two foot, I mean, two stories under this proposal. But if you still have your shed, one story shed, less than 15 foot, you can go within the accessory structure. And we have a statement of reasonableness. And then it would be the standard, approve that, and then approve the motion. So this, it, it's, it's cleaning up and also allowing that two story within the more center of the lot first, the, the edge. And it's, it'll be better for staff uh, because it is, it is somewhat vague. And the 15 foot, there has been, there has been some issues with applicants that need greater than 15 foot. They just can't do it right now, anywhere. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So go back to the drawing again with the six, five and the 10. Okay. Yeah, there. So in that blue area, you could do a two story. Yes, sir. Structure. Yep, and, and this is RM2, which is a large lot zoning. Say for an RC or an RV, which is a smaller lot, the difference between the accessory and, and the principal starts shrinking a little bit. But this one's really good for illustration because it's a larger lot. Like the one that Autumn just proposed was RM1, essentially the same, the same setbacks. All right. Me. Yes, go ahead. Frank. Yeah, so you might have just answered my question on the RM2. Um, are there um, lot size requirements for this? I, I got three questions on this. So, in other words, I mean, are there lot size requirements other than the setbacks? Well, every. Can every, you park a battleship on a postage stamp, in other words? I mean, I, I guess as long as you cover the setbacks, you're good, right? Well, you've got that plus. Uh, plus, also, you've got the, the uh, max size. In other words, you can't build an accessory structure that's greater than 1,100 square foot un under, any, under any circumstance. And that's that whole scale and mass house versus accessory structure because you wouldn't want a tiny home in front, a great big structure in the back. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so I'm thinking about, of course, I play devil's advocate all the time, but um, what would prevent people from rampantly building these structures and 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 really doing the Airbnb business. I mean, is this is this going to be something that people will rent out, or is this a mother-in-law suite? Or um, we, and and then that leads me also my train of thoughts thinking there are a lot of neighborhoods like the one I live in that don't have driveways. Some some of the places don't have driveways. So you know, if you've got a, a an accessory building in the back. Mm -hmm. And already, I'm thinking about my little cul-de-sac, and, and it's just slam packed with cars on the street. Um, I, I just wonder about how we might deal with that. Yeah, th those are good questions, and this one really doesn't 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 deal with the accessory dwelling units. I used that as an example, 
because you're talking about parking, it, it, if, you, if you desire an accessory dwelling unit and you cannot create the parking to serve it, and that's the way the ordinance reads now, you have to prove where, where are they going to park. You, yes, sir. Yeah, 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 that's already covered. But with this provision, if, if parking's tight and you want to do an ADU, then if you can accommodate the parking underneath, you can go up to that two stories. So that's where it kind of ties into ADU, but it could also be a garage with an apartment, which you can build now, but you have to stay under the 15 foot, which is tight. And then um, are we, I mean, I, mean I, I know this whole Airbnb stuff is, is another whole nother ball game, right. but is that something maybe that we're concerned with or in other cities, has this been a problem with people? With with other cities, yes. With Concord, I cannot say that not we've yet. had any issues. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, now, I'm not saying there won't be any issues going forward, but I mean, so far, it's been your mountains and your coast are the ones that are, that are most impacted, you know, by the, by the uh, Airbnbs. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, we're, uh, let me see here, where are we? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit uh, behind here. Any questions? Four. Hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right, number two. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it. I'm just flipping around here like crazy. Consider adopting a resolution in the matter of closing a right of way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Call on Kevin to come back and present this item for council. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski, Ms. Deason. This item is a uh, something we, we don't have a lot of. Uh, it's an alley closure. And uh, this is for a portion of an alley, uh, it's located on uh, the north side of Corbin Avenue, uh, between Corbin and Wilkinson, uh, just east of Hopkins Street. And you see on the left the, uh, the actual map. The right, we have an aerial photograph. This is Hopkins Street, Wilkinson Court, several of the apartments on Corbin. Um, Center City is just to the northeast off corner of the map. Um, in terms of the details, the petitioner is Charles Stapleton. He owns four of those six adjacent properties. The alley has never been open, and never been utilized. It's wooded. It's about 3,300 square feet. There are no utilities within the alley. Uh, we, we floated it to all the city departments. There are no objections to closing the alley. Uh, the petitioner has been briefed on the ownership requirements of the alley. Basically, the portion he owns the, the uh, two of the parcels to the north, two of the four parcels to the south. When the alley's closed, the interest in the alley goes to the, half of it goes to the adjacent property owner unless he um, proposes a plat signed by all the owners giving him control of the alley. He's aware of all of that. So closure of the alley, half of it goes to him, the other half goes to the other owner unless there are arrangements made between the two parties. So essentially, this is the original plat from 1924. Well, actually, it's 1914. Instead of 24, I saw 24, and that's actually when the surveyor's uh, stamp expires. So it's actually from 1914. So if you see the proposed closing, this is Hopkins. Wilkinson is to the north. This is Corbin. And this is the proposed closure in the blue. In 2015, there was a similar closure to the east done by Mr. Suver, who owns the apartments. They closed that part of the alley and that portion. So the reason Mr. Stapleton is requesting the closure is he's proposing a development on the, uh, uh, on the north side adjacent to the alley. If the alley's closed, it allows him to be able to put some retaining walls within that closed part of the alley to facilitate the development. So the next steps would be if you if you uh, agree to do so, to adopt a resolution to set the public hearing for June 8th, what we will do, we will execute the notice in accordance with the statutes that will be mailing a copy of the signed resolution to all of the adjacent owners. We will put signs on 
the property as close as we can to the alley so the public can see that there will be an alley closing. We will run the newspaper notice for four consecutive weeks. Um, are there any, any questions? Any questions from council? Yes, go ahead. Go back two slides to that to that survey, that original. Yeah. So, so when did Corbin go from I-N to A-N? Is that when I Bill was born? <laughs> <laughs> Never seen well, it. Well, I don't never know about that. Never seen it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time I've seen that spelling, too. <laughs> yeah, I did, and I was just sort of wondering where it's been all these years. <laughs> okay. Any more questions about old people? <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Number two, consider amending an um, allocation of 385,000 home funds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mary is going to come back and present this item to council. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski. Um, as council remembers, in June of 2020, yes, it's been a little while ago, you approved the allocation of 385000 in home funds for the rehabilitation of the historic Coleman Mill, and that would have resulted in seven floating home units within the facility. Um, the original investor, because of the COVID-related delays, delays with uh, National Park Service and with DEQ, the original investor backed out at the end of 22, but they did secure a new investor at the beginning of 2023. Um, and that is the result of a new um, majority partner in the, the um, rehabilitation of the Coleman Mill project. Um, Jim Sarah is not the majority partner any, any longer. Uh, Ms. Corinne Winters is currently the majority partner, and she has requested um, to increase the home allocation um, to $770,000 770, of home funds, and that will result in 11 floating units. Um, you have the breakdown of those units, the three bedrooms, two bedrooms, one bedroom, and studio apartments. Um, she has also requested to amend the proposed repayment um, she said that the original she felt was ambiguous and she did not want it to seem that way. So she has uh, requested $20,000 repayment each year for 15 years and then at the end of 15 years a balloon payment for any remainder. And I am happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. All right, question from council. I don't have questions, just comments. Uh, thank you for sticking with this project. Um, it's probably been frustrating for you like it has been for at least myself, uh, moving forward and getting something done. Uh, I'm glad to hear that we have a new leader, a new lead investor, uh, and thank you for explaining all that to me the other day. Uh, just one question. Um, so the request for the increase is due to an increase in the cost of materials? Cost of materials and labor. And labor. All right, so going forward, and, you know, I anticipate that increases will continue to, cost will continue to increase. Will they be able to come back and continuously ask for increases? Um, that would be at council's discretion. Okay, but they can come back. We would just have to make the decision. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. At, at this point, it is not their intention to ask for anything additional because if they ask for more funding, there will be more units, and that will trigger other federal regulations and they're trying, trying not to trigger those federal regulations. Okay, thank you. Okay, Brian. And I have a follow-up on Betty's question. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it was the request from us for the home funds was $55,000 per unit. Now it's around 70000 per unit. Um, is there a certain formula that we have to adhere to with yes. HUD in order to do that, and why is the number higher now? So... The breakdown of the units is actually based on the maximum per unit subsidy that we can put in. So as a municipality, we're allowed to put more into a three-bedroom unit than a studio unit. Um, I can send that breakdown. It actually was just re-released from HUD. Um, they release it every year, and I can send that um, to council so that you can see. But that breakdown is based on what is the maximum amount that can be allocated per unit and how that breaks down to the 770000 so in other words, there's larger units involved in this now. Yes, sir. Just basically just more diversity and, and options. And so it's that's why the it skews a little higher. Yes. 
So That's this, all you need. That's the all. allocation now is going to be three studios, three one bedrooms, four two bedrooms, and one three bedroom unit. Okay, Andy. I just want to thank the majority investor for the email we got today. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that was very helpful, very informative, and so if you would share with that, that was that helps put all of this in good context. Absolutely, we'll be happy to. All the questions. Okay. Is is Mr. Sotari still in it or not? He is. Um, he is now a minority investor, and he currently has uh, just over twenty percent. Okay. All right. Any more questions, Council? All right. Thank you very much. Next, number three, consider authorizing city manager to negotiate and execute a contract with Bolton and Nymphic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Round out the planning department's presentation this evening with Kaylee, and then I think they'll yield the time to other staff members. So, Kaylee, if you would. <laughs> Try and keep it brief. Um, so, for the Concord Mill, or sorry, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne and Ms. Kolchinski, um, today I am going to present about the Concord Mills, Bruton Smith Boulevard, and Excuse Corridor Plan. So as you may know, the 2030 land use implementation work plan calls for a mixed use corridor plan um, in the Concord Mills area. The map you see before you shows the study area boundaries and some of the key property owners and businesses within the area. Uh, the RFQ for this project was released on January 9th with submissions due by February 10th. We received five submissions, which were reviewed by a selection committee made up of planning, transit, transportation, parks and recreation staff, as well as a representative from the Cabarrus Visitors Bureau. Four of the five firms were all very closely ranked, and so we interviewed four. Um, Bolton and Mink was selected from these four firms, and the contract amount for the professional services to complete the plan comes to $158,870, and that is what we're asking you to consider on Thursday. All right. Thank you. Question from Council. Right. Thank you. Item four, consider adopting a resolution authorizing eminent domain. Hey, Mayor, uh, real quick, on that last map, that the red line is the entirety of it, right? The red line. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Apologize. Please. The water department would like to place a water line on Zion Church Road, and we have... Um, four parcels where we can't get the complete easement rights. Um, the uh, One of them is a, just a complete no, and the other ones just have an issue, can't get in touch with the bank to get a consent, things like that. So we're asking for um, permission to take those to under eminent domain. And this one would, pre the one with the, the bank would just preempt them from using that? It, it, we go through the entire process, so we want to do that because if, um, you know, if I stop paying my mortgage, the bank takes the property back, and if you don't have your easement on record with their consent, they can take your easement away, and then you have to go through the whole process all over again to try to get it from the next owner. Okay. Any question from council? All right. Thank you. Item five, consider approving the Concord co-sponsorship of the Concord Bears Juneteenth celebration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as council recalls, you just recently adopted uh, this policy, so this is the first uh, request coming before you, so Ian is going to discuss that with you this evening. Good evening, Mayor, member of his council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski, Ms. Eason. Uh, the application before you tonight is our first application that falls under the newly adopted no, co-sponsorship policy that was approved last month. Okay. Can we hold for one minute? Uh, I'm, if anybody feels like they need to recuse themselves, uh, ask <laughs> council has to approve the recusal. So, is no. Betty had? So, um, any council person can ask to be recused if they feel uncomfortable for any reason. There is not a statutory requirement for recusal in this case, but if Councilwoman Stocks feels uncomfortable, she is well within her rights to ask this council to recuse her from this item. I feel that I should be recused myself, asked to be recused because of my relationship to the committee. Okay. Council, is there a motion to approve her recusal? So, so moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. 
and you'll just dust up out, and we'll find it. you later. Okay. Cone of silence. Yeah, yeah. Cone, cone of silence. All right. So back to you, Valerie. Okay, I mean, so you, when, she, when we finish, we invite her back in. That's correct. She, it's we, just that when you're going to be recused from, from um, an item for any reason, you don't want that person who might have that influence to be sitting in the room looking at you while you're talking about it. Got it. Okay, do we have to vote her back in or just automatically vote back no, in? No, sir. Okay. Just recuse right. her for this Ian, item. Ian, it's all yours. Excellent. Uh, so this is the first application we received under the uh, newly adopted policy uh, from last month, um, and it's for a Juneteenth celebration to be held on June 24th at Marvin Caldwell Park. Um, this was submitted by Councilmember Stocks. Um, after speaking with staff, the only cost that would be incurred by the city would be uh, waiving the shelter reservation fees, uh, as well as uh, a couple hours of staff time to check the facility before and after the event. These costs were estimated to be around $1,000 uh, for the city. Uh, so staff's recommendation would be to approve uh, the co-sponsor application. Okay. Question from council? Uh, Let's just okay. off the cuff question, should we suspend the rules and vote while she's recused so we don't have to do this again Thursday? Or I, mean, I'm, I'm, I would be okay with that. So I move we suspend. Well, let's just make sure that Valerie says we're okay. Yeah, this doesn't require any kind of pub public hearing or advertisement. You can okay. So I would move we suspend the rules to vote on this tonight. While Ms. Stocks is recused. Okay. Is there a second? So there is a motion to suspend the rules and to vote on this, correct? Can we, can we, can we do that together? All right. Any discussion? Well, the motion is the motion is to suspend the rules. So, so we have to have two. We have to have two separate motions. Correct. Okay. So we're suspending rules. All in favor, raise your hand. Now, is there a motion to approve the? I move we uh, approve the application as submitted. Second. Okay. Ready to vote? All in favor? Raise your hand. Thank you. So with that said, we can okay. get we can get. Yes. So are you going to bring us every one of these, and then are you going to have a recommendation? Like I noticed, you said staff recommends. You know, it's approximately X or whatever. Is there going to be a staff recommendation on every one of them, or are you going to be like? Here it is. You guys decide. I'm just curious how this process is going to be. I'll take that one, uh, so Ian doesn't have to answer that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so the whole, the whole purpose behind the the co sponsorship policy was to get this in front of council because we have a plethora of groups in the community, and those seem to be growing each year that want the city to co sponsor events. And so up until now, until the adoption of the policy. That essentially fell in my lap, and which is fine when there's non-controversial groups, so to speak, that ask for this. If there's a, um, you know, and that's something that I would approve at my level. I, I don't feel comfortable telling groups yes or no. And as more of those groups ask to have some sort of valid reason to say no, kind of can get complicated. Uh, you know, that's my saying why they should or should not receive co-sponsorship. There is a cost. And so I want council, these to come before council so that you can see the cost, the time commitment, the actual dollars out that the city is having to, to you know, put forth for some of these events and you all make that decision. Certainly, to answer your question, if council would like for staff to make a recommendation based on cost, based on time commitment, based on personnel and resource requirements for the event, Certainly, we can do that, uh, or we can just bring it to you without a recommendation and let you make that decision. That's entirely up to council. That's a long way to answer your question. I, I, I mean, I like the recommendation part from that perspective. I can also see this being, I mean, I think it's good, first of all, that we recognize and our citizens recognize the city spends a lot of time and money on these co-sponsored events, and so for that alone, I think it's a good thing for us to do. But I personally am okay with the recommendation or that it's okay too to say, you know, we don't have a recommendation on this. We haven't done this in the past or whatever it might be. Just kind of surrounding that is fine. Yeah, and certainly I think if there's concerns with the, with a certain group, again, we haven't really had that to date, but who knows, any group can make this request. Uh, and so if there is a, um, a request from a group that 
city council would not want the city of concord's name on a banner banner or advertising or marketing material for that group that that would be the time for us to say no we don't agree we don't want the city's reputation put forth in this manner and so again you have some buy-in instead of just staff making that call i would agree with jennifer some of these it would be great to get a recommendation other ones of these you need to just bring it to us, say what the cost is, and let us make that decision. You don't need to do that for us every time if you're not comfortable. I think that's putting Lloyd into an interesting spot. That's okay, Mayor. I'm used to it. Um, I, I understand. I understand what Council's saying. I, again, I think if there are issues or red flags that we at staff level see we're going to bring those to council we're not just going to bring you an application and say here you go you know vote on it we're going to bring you that and say look we're, we have concerns because this certain group it's the first time they're making the request we had issues getting information from the group you know we did a little bit of research on this group and here's some of the background and other events there's you know for example maybe their events have a history of violence you know, we want council to be aware of that to make sure that we're making the best decision possible for our citizens. Thank you. And per policy, I'll reach out to council member Sox or or Mayor Stacia. There's no no such thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was just one vote short. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Number six. Consider recognizing Overbrook. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I ask Catherine to come forward and talk about our great neighborhood program and the uh, newest proposed addition. So, Catherine. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council, Ms. Kolchinski, Mr. Payne, and Ms. Deason. I'm here to um, request that council consider formally recognizing and accepting the Overbrook Manor Homeowners Association into the city's Partnership for Stronger Neighborhoods. Since the Partnership for Stronger Neighborhoods program was founded in 2000, 75 neighborhoods have been formally recognized by city council. Overbrook Manor seeks to join the communities in this program. Um, this neighborhood is a 21 acre community with 19 homes located in Northwest Concord. The first homes were built in 2017 and the neighborhood was completed in 2020. The neighborhood is unique in that everyone moved into the community with the same two year period, encouraging the development of friendships among residents. They're an active neighborhood with various annual social events like Christmas parties, socials and Halloween baskets. And they also have community activities um, like food drives and stocking blessing box boxes. Um, so the officers for the association are Janet Smith, Jenny Gettings, and uh, Julie Roberts, who are all here today, and they have submitted the required documentation for recognition. If council uh, decides to approve this request, there will be 55 active neighborhoods in um, our neighborhood program. That's great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, who is who again? I'm Julie Roberts. Okay. I'm Jenny Gettings. Yeah. I'm Janet Smith. Well, Thank you so much. We look forward to have you part of the Neighborhood Association. Thank you. I would like to point out that Janet Smith was a longtime serving principal and one of the best at Weddington Hills. So I'd <laughs> like to recognize teachers and administrators when they're in our presence. So, so, some, some, <laughs> some real life experience there. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing I would just say, because I love maps, um, it's in the northeast side of Concord, not the northwest side. Um, when I saw Overbrook Manor in northwest, I was like, is there another yes. Overbrook? Never. So, yeah. Yes. Northeast. <laughs> yeah. East. You got it now. <laughs> it's in the very, very northeast, too. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just map reading 101. Okay. Moving on to number seven, consider authorizing city manager to negotiate and execute a contract addendum to Warpert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. George is going to come forward uh, from Parks and Recreation and talk about this item with council. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, uh, council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski, and Ms. Deason. For you this afternoon is a request authorizing the city manager to approve a contract addendum with Wolpert NC in the amount of $76,857 for survey and design of roadway improvements for Cox Mill Road, 
accommodating an NCDOT approved entrance into the JE Jim Ramsour Park property. Wolpert was selected by the council in 2020 for the design of Ramsour Park and has been involved throughout. The project's traffic impact analysis was recently completed and approved by NCDOT and city transportation. Roadway improvements now need to be designed <clears throat> to accommodate the park's main entrance onto Cox Mill Road, which you can see uh, on your screens, uh, including median modifications, a turn lane, and utility coordination. The construction drawings for the park have been submitted, completed and submitted for review and approval, and uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, George. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Number eight, consider authorizing city manager to negotiate and execute a contract with Piedmont Asphalt Paving. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Rick from Engineering is going to come up and talk through this item with council this evening. Mayor Dush, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinsky, Ms. Vincent, uh, before you and for your consideration is the repaving of six tennis courts at Les Myers Park. The project was bid, publicly bid, and on, and was advertised publicly, and on the 13th of May, the bids were to be received, but we got no bids. Mm -hmm. uh, we rebid as required by General Patchew, and 10 days later, we received bids again. And this time, we got one bid from Piedmont Asphalt Paying Company in the amount of $494,670. And this is for the complete reconstructions of six tennis courts at Les Myers Park. Uh, the existing courts are in poor shape. I mean, they have cracks, and they are actually not safe to play. Questions? Any questions? I have a question. What's sure. the lifespan or cycle of a tennis court? Yes, because of the condition of the park, because the park was built, or the tennis courts are built, the park entirely is built over an abandoned landfill. So the trash, it has uh, almost 30 feet of trash under it. So it continues to settle, and it will continue to settle for a while. So that reduces the lifespan of the, of the courts. Uh, we expect to get, hopefully, if we do this complete reconstruction, what we're doing is taking it all out and building it all back up and doing some additional compaction and bringing additional stone, that we will get 10 years of life out of these, of these six courts. But normally we go on a recycle, we, we do four years for resurfacing, which is different, it's a little less costly. Thank you. Right, you're welcome. Uh, I'm sorry, how, how long does the reseal last? The, you said four years? Four years. We did these about six years ago, didn't we? These particular uh, courts, uh, don't recall exactly when we did that, but. Thanks. And that's a good looking Concord church you've got on. Thank you. So, so if we, the next phase of this in four to six years, you redo them again, it won't be this kind of construction. It'll just Correct. It won't be that at this goal. Okay. So we're, we're not going to look at another 500,000 and well, it might be, but not what we think. Probably be more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Way In today's going. dollars. Yeah. All right. I have one other trivia question. So, who determines the color? So I've seen courts blue and I've seen yeah. them green. Question. What does that? Who? I'm going to gonna let my Parks and Recreation look at what determines the color. Standard color. Um, what we normally do is do go through USDA. These courts are played on for USDA and also um, high schools. So they have a standard color that they like to use, and we normally rely on them to provide that color scheme. All right, makes sense. Do you Thank have you. a particular color you like? Blue. <laughs> Red and green. Bill, I have one question. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. We got one bid only. One we bid. sent it out twice, and we received one bid back. That's, correct. That's, it. That's it. So there's not one too competitive there. We just no got what we got. Yeah, it's only one, one company. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mayor, those were the courts that I played on at the Concord High School tennis when I played high school. So you might want to make them black and gold, Sheila. <laughs> 
That'd be fine with me. We will move on to item number nine. <laughs> Consider authorizing city manager to execute a contract with Creative Bus Sales. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Andy uh, is going to present this item to council this evening. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Mayor, members of council, we're asking for your approval to purchase four vehicles, specifically for our ADA paratransit program. Uh, we, we have four vehicles, or three vehicles right now, that are well beyond their useful life. Um, they have really become an issue for our maintenance staff and they're compromising the efficiency of our paratransit program. Um, we, we've been looking for these vehicles for about two years now um, because of supply chain issues. Uh, we just have not been able to find them. Uh, it's a national problem that is being faced by transit agencies. Uh, so we were recently made aware of an opportunity through the Oklahoma State Transit uh, contract uh, to purchase um, four of 100 available vehicles. Uh, so we jumped on it, called our transit commission to a special meeting this morning. Um, they voted uh, to recommend approval uh, unanimously for the purchase. Um, we are looking at a price not to exceed 91,550 per vehicle for a total of $366,200. Uh, we have federal grant funding in place to cover 85% of that at $311,270. Um, 15% would be local shares, and that would be split 50-50 by Concord and Kannapolis. And the resulting share for Concord would be $27,465. So we are asking for your approval for the purchase of these four vehicles. I'll take okay. any questions. Well, and just so you'll know, we did, John Squint, myself, and Betty, along with Kannapolis representatives, met today to review this in the de detail, and this is, there's also, you know, we, there possibility of some cash coming back from the sale of the existing vehicles. Not a whole lot, but that gets applied back towards us. Unanimous. Unanimous today. Yes. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you, Andy. Number 10, consider awarding a bid in the amount of $1,178,293. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alex is going to discuss this item with Council. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kojinski, Ms. Deason. This Council item is for the construction of the new substation W, which is, which is a substation that will feed the new Eli, Eli Lilly manufacturing facility. This includes all concrete foundations and all above ground facilities. Electric staff took bids on April 18th, and we had eight construction firms bid. The lowest responsive bidder was Carolina Power and Signalization at $1,178,293. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. And we've worked with them before. We have not. We Well, we have many, many, many years ago, yes, sir, but they're not one that's done one recently for us. Mm. I just didn't remember the name. Um, questions? All right. Thank you very much. Sure. 11, consider approving a modification of an interlocal agreement with Cabarrus County. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Items 11 and 12 are similar in nature. Sue's going to round out the last two items listed on your agenda this evening. Mayor, Council Members, <coughs> Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski. Um, so item 11 is amending, um, asking to modify the interlocal agreement with Cabarrus County. This is a single family lot of record that's in sub area A. Um, and they want to build a single family home. The location is 3868 Highway 200. It's water only. We just, we have a water line on Highway 200. Um, item 12 is very similar. Um, it's located at 4040 Mill Circle, which is our Irish Potato Road. It's in sub area A also. It's just a single family lot of record um, that they want to build a new home on. Um, this, this agreement, we will be coming soon to council with, um, a modification, I guess, to the agreement or an extension or a new agreement. I'm not sure the proper legal term. It's a, ex, uh, renewal. Renewal. Um, it, it does expire this year. And so we're working with the county now on, on language to propose. The county is interested in items like this where it's an existing lot of record to, because um, right now the agreement says if it's if there's a structure there, then the agreement says it, it's okay. If we have an existing water line and there's an existing structure as of the date of the agreement, which is 2008, then there's no issues. The majority that have been coming to us are these, um, they're, they're wanting to build a home. So it's just a lot of, a lot of record. Um, and so county's interested in maybe modifying the language to accommodate these. 
if it was a lot of record in 2008. You know, definitely not to serve any new subdivisions, just existing lots of record. Okay, other questions? All right, thank you. And then we added item 13, which you have in front of you, or any questions dealing with that, with the appointment of CGC members. Okay, uh, anybody want to pull anything off the consent agenda? All right, then I make a motion to move into closed session, pursuant of North Carolina General Statute 143.318.11ac, A3, to consult with an attorney to protect attorney-client privilege, and to consult with an attorney to give instruction concerning a judicial action titled City of Concord versus Barbara Scotia College Incorporated. Is there a motion? So moved. Second, and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good evening.